I'm Dr. Lisa Knowles, and my business is Intentional Dental Consulting. I help dentists find more peace in the way that they practice. And I typically do this by going beyond 32 teeth, which happens to be the name of my blog site too, beyond32teeth.com. And today we are going beyond 32 teeth with a very, very special guest, Karen Lebion. And she is a wonderful author and a health advocate. And I just want to welcome you, Karen. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Well, I thought we would jump right in with some interview questions, and um, if at all possible, I'm going to have you speak a little bit closer to your mic a little bit, too, because I know it's it's a little echoey, but it might be a little... There we go. So if you'll just maybe start out, tell us a little bit about your background. How did you decide to write the two books that I know of? Maybe you've written more. Um, maybe give us the names of those two books, and what inspired you to uh, start writing these books? Well, the two books are called French Kids Eat Everything and Getting to Yum. The first is a memoir about our family journey that began when I moved with my French husband and our two young and picky eater children to France for a year to live in my husband's home village, which is in the northwest part of France, a really small rural fishing village. And it was a year of uh, challenge and discovery because what we figured out soon after arriving, at least I figured out, I think my husband was already in the know, was that French kids were expected to eat a wide variety of foods. In fact, they were taught to eat a wide variety of foods at home and at preschool and uh, you know, every, at, at school. And so my older one was in um, kindergarten, the younger one was in preschool, and we all got a French food education. So over the course of the year, our family learned all the techniques that French families and teachers use to teach children to learn to love healthy food. And my kids went from basically a beige food diet to eating and loving a whole wide variety of foods, mussels, salad. Um, my younger daughter's very favorite food is uh, stinky blue cheese, roquefort cheese. And so I can't take a lot of credit for this. I mean, I was learning as well. Um, but the amazing thing is, um, as a mom and a professor, I was able to read some of the research behind this and figure out there was a, basically 100 years of history of research in early childhood education by um, doctors um, and more recently by neurologists, sociologists, comparative anthropologists, psychologists, all of whom have figured out some of the key techniques you can learn uh, as a caregiver or parent uh, that enables you to teach your child to love healthy foods. And those are the focus of the second book, Getting to Yum, which is a guide for uh, parents and teachers and caregivers of all ages. I have that book, and I'm going to put it right in front of me, Getting to Yum. So it's a great book, great book. Well, uh, thank you. And I, I know... Um, in dentistry, I hear quite often that parents, they can't get their children to eat anything. And and they, they are just too tired to cook when they get home. And so what, what do I say to those parents? Well, there are certain um, few simple things you can do to change your family's eating routine. That's the how of eating. To improve what your children eat. So you mm -hmm. improve the how and then the why uh, the what and why follows. Okay. So let me give you a simple example. Um, the French have a lovely tradition, which is the veggies first tradition. At mm -hmm. lunch and at mm -hmm. dinner, at school and at home, the first thing that's served is a small plate of vegetables. And if your child has not had a snack within one hour of dinner, which I would strongly recommend, mm -hmm. in fact, the French approach is one snack per day, about two hours before dinner, uh, for kids of two, two years old and up. Mm -hmm. So they are not snacking otherwise. Um, and then we'll get to the table fairly hungry, and you will find they are going to eat those vegetables with a lot less complaining. Um, it doesn't take a lot more effort when you're doing the groceries once a week to, you know, get some baby carrots, some cherry tomatoes, things that just don't require any prep. You can serve those veggies raw most of the year. And the, all the research actually shows that kids not only eat more of the veggies at that first um, serving, they then go on to eat more veggies during the meal. It sort of primes the pump and gets them over the little resistance of eating veggies. Oh, so good. Yeah. 
I think I'm kind of on the right track. And I, that's what I've been telling. And that's kind of what we did with our two children, too, is trying to get them to eat the serve the peas first when they were younger, even starting out. So it's good to hear that you're right on with that, too. So. And those are small servings. Remember, kids have stomachs that are the size of their fists. That's pretty small mm -hmm. for a toddler. That could be four cherry tomatoes, and then you're pushing it. I mean, yeah. so it's a lot less intimidating for kids to get super small portions. Okay. and uh, to control how much they are given. And that also often works wonders. Okay, good. I will I will do that. And, and I know it's it's often a tricky spot for us dentists is we want to recommend, make recommendations, but um, sometimes parents aren't always willing or wanting to hear that at, at that moment. So good to know that uh, that's kind of what you found in, in your research and things too. So um Obviously, uh, we see kids and, and parents, too, with cavities. So here's, here's another, I'll give you another one of my favorites that, that I hear a lot. And a parent will say to me, you know, my child will only drink chocolate milk. And, and they will not eat any green vegetables. I can't get them to do any of this. So any behavioral suggestions you might have that dentists and hygienists, we can say to the parents that's not offensive to them, but yet helps them understand that maybe these food choices and drink choices aren't uh, so healthy for their child? Um, well, I, I do think that we have a culture of individualism in North America where uh, uh, health professionals are more um, cautious about giving advice on eating than in other countries. Mm -hmm. When I was in, if you were asking me this question when we were in France, the doctor would, and dentist would be quite firm about telling you not to buy chocolate milk. Mm -hmm. Your child will drink plain milk if it's the only thing in the house. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a kind of a tough love message, or maybe just a, a love message, mm -hmm. that we're not used to hearing. But um, I think the culture around this is changing. Uh, you see it in the pediatric food uh, and nutrition guidelines that have just been updated by the American and the Canadian Association of Pediatricians, where they're okay. now saying maximum flavor as early as possible for children, and that means six months. Don't worry about allergies anymore unless your family has a history of very severe allergies. Huh. Mm -hmm. You can do what the French do, which is basically introduce one new food per meal, okay. have lots of variety, maximize flavor exposure, and so by the time your child gets to that inevitable pick eating phase around the age of two or three. It is a very common thing. Okay. In fact, it's a universal phase, as far as we know. They won't stay there very long. So so it's, it's nip it in the bud if you can, and that's mm -hmm. why getting to young focuses on preventing picky eating before it emerges. Mm -hmm. And if it has emerged, you will have to work, wean your child off of children's food, and that's by a process of gradual substitution. So with chocolate milk, okay, day one, it's like one-third white, normal plain milk and the rest chocolate. Day two, half and half. Day three, only a quarter chocolate milk. Day four, only a smidgen. Day mm -hmm. five, chocolate milk is gone. And once it's gone, you don't buy it again. And so mm -hmm. uh, weaning your child off of, uh, over a period of about a week will work for a lot of foods. It actually works for adults too. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. Uh, good, good advice. So I like to have something concrete to offer my patients. And I know now, um, not just now, but in many years recently, but still becoming more prevalent in dentistry is the age one dental visit. And that at that age one dental visit is a perfect time to be introducing all these nutrition guidelines and thoughts for parents. And I know um, that's going to be so helpful for the dentists out there to just be able to sometimes... They say, well, what am I going to talk about with a, you know, with a one-year-old and their parents? Obviously, you're not going to talk a lot to the one-year-old. It's the parenting and the educational opportunity. So thank you. That's a perfect time that we can do that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, just tell parents that, look, there are three things you're going to do with your child before they're four or five years old. The essential skills are um, potty training, sleep training, mm -hmm. and taste training. If you expose them to a whole wide variety of flavors, those rigid habits won't set in later. Um, so it's it's it actually is so easy to do when you start young. So I love the idea of the dentist that when you know the one year visit talking about that. That's fantastic. Good. So several things really resonated with me when I read your books, and one of them is in your new book, Getting to Yum. 
you quoted Elizabeth Satcher and her phrase, division of responsibility. Can you elaborate on that for me and who, the listeners today and explain to parents how can this division of responsibility be done? So Ellen Satter, uh, her last name is spelled S-A-T-T-E-R, is a wonderful writer on children's food. She's been a classic. Her books are now about 30 years old. and She's still widely read if you're training in anything related to nutrition. Okay. And she came up with this idea of the division of responsibility that specifies that parents control when and what is served, but children get to decide whether they eat and how much they eat. Okay. Now keep in mind this was occurring at a time when authoritarian parenting styles were much more common. And the finish your plate mantra was much more prevalent mm -hmm. and, and um, nutritionists were realizing that this was actually leading kids to override their own internal signals about fullness. So there was a concern that more control needed to be given to children to help them develop the skill of being a competent eater. The only adjustment I would make to Satter's philosophy, which is wonderful, is that we're now living in a very different era where permissive parenting is the norm. And that means that um, a slight addition to her division of responsibility that I would add would be kids need to be encouraged, in fact, in some cases required, to taste new foods. So they don't have to eat it, but they do have to taste it. And they don't have to like it, but they do have to talk about it using appropriate vocabulary. Why? Because all the research shows that you need to taste a new food about um, a dozen times before you learn to like it. Okay. Adults can try this. Pick a food you don't like. Maybe you don't like olives. Maybe you don't like cauliflower. If you actually taste it repeatedly over the period of about two weeks, you will learn to like it. It's just an interesting physiological phenomenon. Hmm. So, um, so add that to the Satter formula, and you have an approach that's gentle and supportive, that gives kids reasonable autonomy, yet still helps them along the path of learning to be a competent eater. Awesome. Okay. Like that. Like that. Like that for myself too. There's some things that I, I, I need to. It often works if older kids are resistant. Mm -hmm. Tell the parents, turn the tables, get them to pick a challenge vegetable for you mm -hmm. or food for you. Good idea. You don't like, they're going to help you learn to like it over two weeks and then it's their turn. Ah, perfect. So perfect. Like the yeah, yeah. Turning the tables. Um, so here's another thing, just personally as, as a parent, um, I've had quite a hard time with other parents sometimes and, and the pressures placed upon me as a mom, and, and, you know, at the, my kids games and activities, I, I watch parents bring their kids these giant size Gatorades to sporting events and then they, they want to have a snack after the practices and after each game. And so, you know, I usually, I pull the dentist card at that point and say, well, I'm a dentist and they kind of, their eyes, you know, light up and they go, oh, well, um, we don't, we can have a more healthy snacks, but it, you can tell and they kind of look at my kids like, oh, those poor kids of hers, they never get anything good. Um, and so there's a lot of pressure, I think, that parents put on one another about what is and isn't um, appropriate, I guess, or should be appropriate. Now, I always put the pressure back on of, what is healthy and what should our kids really need but what i know a lot of other parents who who can't pull the dentist card or the uh you know something like that i'm a i'm a nutritious nutritionist what do they say to these other parents that are giving them so much pressure about snacking and these things their kids might want well the first thing that i would offer you know just coming from the kind of french um multicultural family that we have is that Food is fun, and um, nice things like sweet cupcakes or cookies for snack, they're fun, mm -hmm. and our kids are not deprived of them. And the mm -hmm. French approach is all about moderation, not deprivation, and that's really key. So, you know, in our North American culture, we tend to teach kids that um, good for you foods taste bad, like spinach, mm -hmm. or bad for you foods taste good, like candy. But um, the French have a much more kind of emotionally neutral approach. Like basically, there are some foods you eat most of the time, like spinach, and there are some foods you eat some of the time, or just as a treat, like candy, and it's all good. So mm -hmm. the, the 
it's I, but I see what you're talking about in terms of the pressure from other parents in our culture, and it's all tied up with these emotional associations with food. So it's complicated. Mm-hmm. I mean, so but my kids don't snack um, during the weekend. It's like breakfast, lunch, dinner. They they, we, they don't even have an afternoon snack in the morning usually, unless mm-hmm. we're going to be having dinner later than usual. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it's pretty easy to fall into that new routine. And all of the studies show that kids self-regulate appetite. So if they're not getting the snacks, they then move to eating more at meal times. If you serve mm-hmm. foods that have a higher um, uh, satiety, fullness feeling, mm-hmm. so you need some healthy fats with those meals, they'll be they'll be able to last longer between meals. And um, and I would hold really firm. You know, when we were growing up. Kids snacked once a day on average. One quarter of kids didn't snack. There are these very um, comprehensive government surveys of eating behaviors for the past 50 or 60 years, and you can see the increase in prevalence of snacking. The average number Mm -hmm. of snacks per day now in in this generation of kids is three snacks per day. One in uh, four kids eats five snacks a day, plus meals. Wow. It's basically unregulated eating behavior. Yeah. And so, you know, I, you know, um, in, in the snack time all the time culture, I just offer my sincere reasons. I say, I find my kids don't eat a good dinner if they snacked, so we don't snack. Thanks. Well, that looks really good, that cupcake. We usually have that kind of thing for dessert. Mm-hmm. And, and I know that sounds a little bit uh, like controversial, but I think as parents, it's so good for us to start a dialogue about it, like a non-judgmental dialogue, mm-hmm. because I think we do need cultural change given the obesity rates the obesity rate in France is well under 10%, and in the U.S. and Canada, it's edging 40%. I know, I know. And, and, and yeah, and the diabetes, too. I mean, it's just um, scary. Ooh. And, and, of course, we have great we're great consumers of snacks and we have a lot of a lot of television and ads and advertisements encouraging the purchasing of snacks. So, we've got a lot of things working against us. Uh, so, yeah. But I think that's all the more reason to sort of, you know, in a blame-free way, uh, chat to people about mm-hmm. the, you know, if your family makes some changes. And most parents would really love their kids to eat more vegetables. They just don't know how. So yeah. if you talk simply about the how, meaning we cut out snacks, and mm-hmm. it was this amazing transformation. My kids suddenly started eating veggies, which is often what parents tell me. Right. Um, that's good to hear that because I, I – I think parents do need to hear that and feel reassured that they're not depriving their kids and they're not going to have a, you know, I think you referenced it in your book too, is that they're not going to have a hypoglycemia or reaction if they don't um, have something to eat every two hours. Obviously, there are medical situations where that that is an exception to the rule. But in general, most kids will be okay and be able to sustain themselves for several hours, maybe with that one snack in the afternoon. So... Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, let me. I'm going to keep moving on here. Uh, in your book, Getting to Yum, I'm going to reference that again. You discuss a study completed on a thousand British primary school students. This was fascinating to me. I was hoping you could just recreate that. Tell me a little bit more about that study and our listeners, and kind of what you make of a uh, kids' food literacy these days. So there have been lots of amazing studies done of the food knowledge of young children in countries like the U.S. or Britain or Australia. And the findings are pretty amazing. I mean, you get findings like only 25% of five or six year olds know that milk comes from cows. When you ask them where, I know, when you ask them where, you know, hot dogs come from, some say trees, some say sheep. I mean, they really have no clue. I mean, of course, you know, when you're five or six, you have this lovely, sometimes fantasy world, and those are lovely images, but. Um, the stu- follow-up studies when kids are 10 or 11 or 12 show the same thing. The study they did in Australia found that less than a quarter of kids correctly identify the vegetable or animal sources of their, their lunch. And it was a lunch with, like, I don't know, a hamburger, milk, and, and some simple kind of veggie. So low food literacy mm-hmm. is an issue. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not something that's taught at home or taught at school uh, because, you know, uh, in a food-abundant culture... We have other priorities. Interestingly, in, in many other countries, however, it is taught in schools. Uh, mm-hmm. It's explicitly part of the curriculum in Japan, in Italy, in France. And they, they have all sorts of interesting ways that food has worked into the science curriculum, arts curriculum, culture curriculum. Um, in Japan, kids are told you should eat 
30, that is three zero, 30 different foods a day and 100 wow. different foods a week. Mm, wow. That's yeah. probably some kid's whole diet, 100 foods in their whole lifetime. <laughs> I know. So, so uh, you know, I, I think it's, these are, are, are high performing countries academically. They're not yeah. sacrificing the quality of their math teaching because no. they do a little more food and nutrition. Mm -hmm. And I know that um, uh, there is a movement uh, in, you know, in the States to kind of reinsert a lot of this into the curriculum. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is this is something that can actually be amazing for kids in lots of other ways because the new approach to teaching isn't focused on nutrition. It's not punitive nutritional information like eat this because we need your calcium. It's mm -hmm. really focused on games a lot of which are simple neurobiology experiments around mm. all of the senses and how they relate to our sense of taste and our appreciation of food. And that's why Getting to Yum has the games. It has 20 really fun games. And I just did a mm. workshop last weekend and um, had parents and kids playing these games and I had some parents write to me and saying, like, these were totally transformative. We went home, we played the game every day. All of a sudden, my child is, is, is uh, more comfortable with textures of new right. foods. Because a lot of the, you know, the, the resistance to new foods is texture, not taste. Mm -hmm. And so there's some texture play games you can use that overcome that. So so um, educating kids, yes, but in a fun, playful way is is, uh, is the approach that Getting to Yum recommends. Yeah, I think that that's, those are great games that you have in your, in your book. And just that how, how do we do it? I think that is a stumbling block for so many parents because we didn't grow up with it either. And so no one... No one taught us, but television and what we read and kind of what our friends ate, you know, next to us. Um, so it's really, I, I think those those games in your book are very helpful to parents to understand how. So it's great. And fun, you know, right. like having fun with your kids around food is key for the family. Keep it light, you know. Right, right. Uh, so I'm going to skip to your other book, uh, French Kids Eat Everything. You you mentioned a little bit about satiety, and I hope I'm saying that correctly, satiety. Um, can you go a little further? I know you just basically mentioned it. What, what exactly is that? And, and that was something that was very, and I, and I want you to talk about this just a little bit more in depth because I didn't think about it this way. Sometimes you're just, I'm serving nutritious foods, but I wasn't exactly hitting the mark. So if you could go just a little bit further on that, I think it's really important. Okay, so... Um... If you're not snacking, and so you're only eating three meals a day, or you have one mini meal snack at about 3.30 or 4, um, mm -hmm. that is uh, like a mini meal, it's not snack foods, um, you're going to be waiting several hours between meals. And uh, it's easier to do that if the foods that you eat are both nutritious and fairly filling. Now, the word filling sounds scary, right? It sounds like calories, calories. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there are... Uh, we do need calories mm -hmm. <laughs> for our bodies, mm -hmm. and and uh, in fact, we also need healthy fats. It's especially mm -hmm. important for children. Healthy fats are really important for brain development, especially up in, you know when they're young. But even um, uh, ongoing health, because some vitamins are fat soluble. So um, the the key to raising satiety or satiety, as you pronounced it, um, is adding. Uh, a reasonable amount of healthy fats to your meals. Mm -hmm. The research studies show that this increases your fullness feeling for much longer. So the French, for example, at lunch would have a small slice of full fat cheese um, with their salad at the end of the meal, and that will help a child last two hours longer mm -hmm. than they otherwise would. So if you're serving, um, let's say, in a North American equivalent, let's say you're having a snack and you have like a, a bread and... Um, or crackers, um, if you add a bit of butter or cheese, then you've got that healthy fat and carb combination that will help you last longer. Throw in some pulses or legumes, like some chickpeas. My kids love chickpeas. Mm -hmm. They're inexpensive. Um, they're tasty. You know, that will really help. So a little bit of protein and healthy fat, as well as carbs at every meal, will uh, make sure that the, um, you've got a really high nutritional punch for the amount of calories that you're eating. So it's like nutrient dense food is the word that nutritionists mm -hmm. use. Mm -hmm. And that will then um, uh, enable your child to last longer between meals. 
Oh, awesome. Awesome advice. I love that point. We don't think about it sometimes. And then, you know, as a parent, you do give them something while well, they just had a snack and they burn through it if it's carbs and they're hungry again in an hour or two. So that was something that we really tried to work on in my family too, is um, putting in the little bit of protein, the more, a little more fats. Um, we all know about the fat craze that <laughs> hit our, our country. So protein starved in North America. We mm -hmm. have probably too much protein. But so so sometimes healthy fats, which is good, like um, they often go together of course. Mm -hmm. But you know, if you're giving them celery and carrots, do give them cream cheese to dip with. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, and don't be afraid, um, don't teach them to be afraid of fatty food in moderation. I know that I was a victim of that, I think, personally and so that the whole fat craze of don't eat too much fat, don't eat skim milk, fat free milk, all, all that um, has now I know it's being discouraged now and have have the fat, have the um, obviously not too much and some of the good fats as you said so um, really have to change our way of thinking and put that into a different perspective and learn about that. I know I had to learn a lot of it and your book taught me a lot. So, um, any, I don't want to keep you too much longer, but any last thoughts that you, uh, might want to share for health professionals in particular or parents listening, uh, to this interview wisdom you want to share or, um, can tell yeah. us. Well, a simple message to good parents is this. You can teach your child to eat just like you can teach them to read. Mm. It takes time and persistence, but if you expose them over time to new flavors and textures in a loving and comfortable and supportive environment, like a learning reader, they're a learning eater, mm -hmm. not a picky eater, they're mm -hmm. a learning eater, mm -hmm. they will eventually get there, except for the small proportion of kids who do have underlying medical issues, which of course need to be addressed and taken seriously. But for the majority of kids, picky eating is just a phase, just like the no phase. They will get over it. It's not mm -hmm. a life sentence. And... Um, on the website, gettingtoyum.com, there are lots of free resources. There's a great A to Z veggies and fruits placemat to download. And there are um, uh, really fun taste training plans mm. for yeah. babies and older kids so that parents uh, or you know caregivers or dentists or other health professionals who would like to support parents teach their kids. It's mm -hmm. all laid out. You can sign up and get them on a week by week basis. And you graduate at the end of 12 weeks with a little certificate. And it, you've learned a lot of the games and mm -hmm. rituals and routines that, that you can then keep repeating that will get your kid on the path to, to being an adventurous year. Oh, wonderful. Thank you for all of your good work in creating that. I know that's not a small task so amazing um if someone wants to go get your book um french kids eat everything or getting to yum i know it's on amazon.com anywhere else or that you would recommend we find it um, it's on all the major you know book websites okay. um support your local bookseller if you can mm -hmm. you can buy, you can buy it off my website as well when it's okay. in stock um and uh, I'd really encourage people to share. I know that um, a lot of people have said to me that they've shared it with uh, people about to have their first child. Mm -hmm. So circulate those copies. Uh, oh, right? that's a great one. That's going to be my new gift giving, uh, baby gift giving book. <laughs> Great idea, great idea. Um, and, I, and I believe you have a blog site too, if anybody wanted to follow you or wants to read a blog. What is the name of your blog? It's FrenchKidsEatEverything.com. Okay. And, and, you know, fun updates about and recipes and lots of just fun resources for parents and, and nice stories about parents who've tried this approach and had some true success. So, awesome. yes, yeah, FrenchKidsEatEverything.com. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Karen, for enlightening uh, all of us, enlightening me with your books, and hopefully you'll spread that word to more dentists, dental professionals, hygienists, physicians, all the care professionals. We have such an opportunity to make an impact on the, uh, the nutrition and health of our patients in, in a number of ways. So uh, appreciate you being a resource out there for us to dip into as well to help our patients. So thank you for joining me. It was a real pleasure. Thank you.